Concrete is the second most used material in the world after water. With the world's population estimated to grow to 9 billion by 2050 and 2 billion more people expected to live in cities, 60% of the built environment is not yet built. This represents the equivalent of building New York City every single month. In a circular economy, nothing gets lost. Everything gets reused and recycled in a cradle-to-cradle -cradle approach. By giving a second life to construction and demolition waste, we can preserve Earth's precious resources. I see a great potential in this area when you consider that 1.6 billion people lack access to adequate housing in the world today. The NEST is the largest scale demonstrator to accelerate innovation and research in construction. Together with our 120 partners from academia, business and the public, explore the future of buildings. Concrete is a great material. It's very flexible, it's very performing. And it's my belief there is no way without concrete for our future. As the world's global leader in building solutions, we are shaping the future of construction right here and right now. The future is green, the future is circular, the future is digital. Sustainability is a game changer for all of us. That's why I'm putting it at the heart of our strategy. And we are experimenting the next generation of circular products right here, with 50% recycled content inside. This is a cargo ship, and this represents what we are doing in sustainability in La Fashion Sim, because it's a journey, and as you can see, we are moving. But more than a journey, this one is removing 100 trucks of the road every single day. And this is exactly what we want to do. We want to build a world that works for the people and the planet. In La Fajol team, we are firmly committed to be part of the solution to solve today's climate crisis. This is why we set the most ambitious 2030 target in our industry, validated by Science Based Target Initiative. Carbon neutral building is within our reach. You can see it happen all around us here. By pioneering new technologies from digitalization to 3D printing, we are shaping the next frontier of green building solutions. But we didn't just look at what's a long-term goal. We look at what are we going to do tomorrow morning? So no time to wait. We must start running right now. By using advanced computational design and engineering, we can model the structure of buildings so that material is only used where it's really needed. It's about optimizing material performance through structural geometry. In the HILO unit, we really want to show the future of construction in concrete. More specifically, we want to show a new way of building sustainably and following the principles of circular economy. I'm excited to work in concrete because you can shape concrete where it wants to be. We developed a concrete with 100% of the aggregates and 50% of the cement made from recycled construction demolition waste without compromise on performance. And concrete is a prime material to offer sustainability targets because it can be reused over and over and over again. What you see behind me, right there, this is construction and demolition waste. This is basically an old building. We broke it down in those pieces. We're going to grind it, make it back into powder, straight back in our cement or in our concrete. This is how this year we recycled more than 48 million tons of waste, making us a leading waste treatment company. Our ambition is to reach 100 million tons of waste recycled by 2030. Sustainability is to do a better world for the planet, but also for the people. So let's talk about the people for a second. In Malawi, there is a shortage of 70,000 schools as of today. We are building our first school in 3D printing right there. This is how we can support livelihood with our products. The beauty of concrete is that it doesn't only bring high strength and durability to construction, it is also infinitely recyclable. That's why for me, 
It is the ideal material to build a net zero future. I'm a big believer in the circular economy. The future isn't written, it's built. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar titled Parametric Design and Digital Fabrication. Now the focus is about outdoor learning spaces. Now it's about time for us to talk outdoors once again, because as we all know, the world is starting to heal from the pandemic. My name is Jacko Manalang from the Architecture Communication Studio Laboratory, and I'll be your host for today. Now this event by the UP College of Architecture is a collaboration among the Architectural Communication Studio Laboratory, Building Science Studio Laboratory, and Urban Design Studio Laboratory. Now, this event is also in partnership with the UP College of Architecture Alumni Foundation, and also made possible by our sponsor, Holsim Philippines, the Cemento and Aggregates, alumni natin yan sa Holsim tayo. Now, acknowledging also the presence of our Dean, Dean Grace Ramos, Assistant Dean Faith Varona, Secretary Kath Nadal, and other members of the Executive Committee. Now, let's just have a short recap of the previous webinars. We've talked mostly about the number one, the introduction to parametric design, and two, we talked about the related topics to parametric design, and three, the software of choice when it comes to parametric design. So that's Rhino and Grasshopper. Ano nga ba uli ang parametric design for those who don't know? It sounds, it sounds like one of those buzzwords in architecture, right? So concepts like green architecture, adaptive reuse, intelligent buildings, all those big words. Now, parang, di ba? It's, it's, it sounds like the, those concepts that we use over and, over and over again in school. Now, I believe most of us here are architecture students and architecture graduates, and chances are to some, uh, to some degree we have encountered the term parametric design. Now, you're probably thinking of Frank Gehry, Santiago Calatrava, uh, Zaha Hadid, convoluted forms, advanced geometry, intricate mesh, futuristic design, maybe even alien spaceships, who knows? So those architects that I've mentioned earlier, Hadid, Gary, and Calatrava, they are some of the front runners of parametric design, and they take advantage of the computers, advanced, uh, advanced computing, computation techniques, and specialized software in order to generate magnificent, uh, these magnificent formations of architecture. But you know what? Uh, eventually, I realized that Parametric design, it's not really more about the forms. Parametric design, it's, it's more about the process or the parametric process. Again, parametric design is really not much about the forms, but it's more of the process, the parametric process. So imagine you have this sets of numbers and you're, you're creating, you can create uh, tangible objects or tangible buildings just by using these numbers. 
Does that make sense? Well, anyway, enough of the chit chat. Let's go to the welcoming remarks by none other than our very own Sir Butch Boat. Now, Prof. Butch Boat is the coordinator of the PhD, Design Build Environment of the UP College of Architecture, as well as he is the head of the Building Science Department. So, Sir Butch, we'd love to hear from you. Take it away. Good morning, everyone. Parametric design has come a long way from its beginnings in the analog design experimentations of uh, Antonio Gaudi and Freotto to the more recent and more recognizable works of uh, Zaha Hadid and uh, Santiago Calatrava. Still, the principles and the methods are the same, and that is the generation of uh, uh, forms through the uh, manipulation of parameters. In the past sessions, uh, what has been shared to us was only the uh, initial steps or introduction to parametric design. And as you have seen, even the creation of a box uh, using visual programming can be quite uh, not an easy task to do. Uh, in today's session as well as in the future sessions we hope that we will be able to explore parametric design much deeper once you have uh, understood and hopefully mastered parametric design you will find yourselves able to create forms which might be difficult to uh, obtain using um, conventional means in addition parametric designs allow us also to incorporate environmental factors in our design forms. Environmental factors can be simulated through computation and uh, parametric design be able to include such computational works in your exploration of design forms. I hope that uh, the training and workshop uh, would leave a lasting mark on all of you and it will prove to be very uh, applicable in your future design works. Let us all look forward to today's session with much enthusiasm. Have a nice day and thank you. All right, as always, Sir Butch, amazing. Thank you for sharing to us the importance and the relevance of parametric design to our practice as of now in this, in this time. So let me introduce you to our two speakers. We have our first speaker, Architect Serio Alonso del Campo. Now, Architect Serio will be with us again to give us a deeper understanding in Grasshopper and PDDF. Now, Architect Serio is the co-CEO and co-founder of Control Mad Advanced Design Center in Madrid. He is an architect from the University of Valladolid. He finished his Master of Structural Analysis at UP Barcelona, UBC Barcelona, Barcelona and UP University of Padova, Italy. Architect Del Campo is an authorized Rhino instructor and has been a professor at the University, European University of Valencia and a visiting professor and lecturer at several universities, including LAAC Barcelona, University of Sassari, IED Madrid, College of Architecture of Valladolid, La Coruña, and San Pablo CEU Madrid. 
Architect Serio's lecture will be followed by a lecture on outdoor learning spaces by none other than our very own faculty member, Professor Aaron Julius Lesiones. Now, Professor Aaron is also an architect who finished his BS architecture from UP Diliman. He took his Master's of Science in Practicing Sustainable Development at Royal Holloway University of London. Currently, Professor Lesiones is the director of the Office of Extension Program in UPCA. Now, without further ado, let me pass the stage to our first speaker, Architect Serio, for his lecture on Grasshopper, uh, part three of this PDDF webinar. So, buenos dias, Arquitecto. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thanks for the introduction, Professor Jaco and Professor Bot. Uh, well, I hope you you had a nice weekend and, and hope also you had a strong coffee for today because uh, we have a very short time to explain you a couple of things more really interesting. And, and again, it's not my goal here to try to make very complicated shapes, uh, fireworks in architecture and so on, which is nice, but at least to understand uh you know what this what how how is the connection how is the management uh the data in grasshopper so the idea is with that you can experiment you can research later on with more complex forms and so on but at least to understand the workflow of the tool to you know go beyond with uh with this software okay so um i i don't know if you can you could share my screen so we can start from you know from uh open file in, in rhino just a plain file because i before coming back to the table file remember i have in a backstage here so this is the you know the 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 file we already played with uh in the last session so before doing that to understand something uh quickly let's let's explain um the list management in grasshopper which is a very complicated topic uh, I hope you can understand a little bit today, but I mentioned, don't worry, don't, I mean, don't feel depressed because it's so, you know, the first time you see that is so complicated at the beginning, but, you know, practice a little bit more, try to understand with more samples that you can find on the internet, you can find in different books and tutorials, and then, you know, step by step, I hope you can, you can um, understand much better. So just to keep it simple, let's play with, uh, you know, very uh, easy geometry, like a point. Remember, we uh, created uh, a point of a first session, but in this case, let's play with multiple points. So I'm going to generate with the right click on this icon, right click i'm going to put i don't know around seven points six seven points in in a kind of a column it's not necessary to be totally vertical but you know i think i have there seven repeat again or press enter and put less points here in another column like uh, four or five something like that so if I'm telling you, try to connect with Rhino, try to connect the uh, these points with lines, maybe, I mean, it's really up to the user, right? So some of you think about connecting first, the first column, right? To the second column and so on. Another one maybe is trying to connect in a six. So there are many, plenty ways to connect these uh, points but let's see how grasshopper uh, uh, links these points uh, using lines okay so uh, we are playing in the search keyboard because it's faster try to find the point with the hexagonal shape with the hexagonal value this one right this is this is bringing points into my you know into my uh, grasshopper scripting so um, if I need to collect more points, it's very similar to the to the process we already know. So right click on the point component, and instead of set one point, I'm going to select set multiple points. Okay, so I just go by order. Doesn't matter if it's going up to down or in the other way, but one by one to make it simpler. 
here. So you just start clicking and selecting these points and just right click or press enter when you are done. Okay, so you see they are already collected in this component. I'm going to repeat again. So again, try to look for point value here, and I'm going to repeat, right click, set multiple points, and choose this other column here. Okay, here you go. I have these points and these points. And let's see how it's working Grasshopper with this information. So if I just go to the same component, we already deal with the line, right? This is making lines with points. So let's connect and see what it's doing. OK, what we have inside is a first list of points. And remember, if you put a panel, Panel is a very clever tool to see what's going on in the inside of a component. So this is telling you that here I have the list number zero with seven elements. And you see the zero counts, right? From zero to six. And if I connect this panel here, I have another list of points with five elements. So the thing is to understand that Grasshopper works with longest list. That means that if you have here seven elements and here five, when it's going to the fifth element in the shortest list here, it's trying to connect the remaining ones with the other elements of the list, the longest list one. OK, that's the most important thing. And well, if you don't like the way how it's connecting that, I mean, I'm sorry, but this is how the default Grasshopper works, OK? It doesn't work in another. Uh, it makes sense, because if imagine I have a list of 1,000 points, 1,000 coordinates. In another list, just one circle, a component one circle, which is a longest list distribution, is going to generate 1,000 circles. Because I have the longest list is, the let's say, the most important one. The one is working always. OK? But there is another way to connect this information, to work with a different information. So. Um, well, first of all, let's try to find the way Grasshopper works. So there is a special component that is called longest list. You try to find it in the search keyboard, longest list. So this is like a filter. You see, it's list A, list B doing something here, and list A, list B. So if you I'm just going to connect, don't worry, because Automatically, they are going to disconnect the cables here. So I'm going just to work this like an intermediate component. And you see, there's nothing changes, because I told you that Grasshopper works by default with the longest list. I mean, I have here, and this is very common in, in some components. If you zoom in on the components, you see something, some letters below the under the, the component, right? Repeat last. That means that you can change something in this component. So for example, if you right click, right click, on the you know on the component name, you have some settings, some options that you can change. Instead of repeat the last, you can repeat first. Okay, so you, you, let's say it's inverting the way that is working the longest list. You can go to interpolate, like it's trying to let's say balance between the end and the start uh, points of the of the list. There's like looking like kind of symmetry. OK, and there are another ways, but there's not so common to work, like wrap and flip and so on. But um, there, is, there are other options to work, not longest list. But in this case, I'm going to come back to the repeat uh, last, which is the usual one. So instead of using the longest list, you can use the shortest list. So if you just go into the search keyboard and try to find the shortest list, I'm going to take out this panel because I think it's clear, right? Here you go. So let's see. Don't worry about the cables right now. Just try to connect list A and list B okay, with these points and try to connect later on the, I'm sorry. OK, here you go. And you see, now it's working with the shortest list, only with the five first elements, and then there is no connection in the in the last part of the longest list. Okay, of course there are on a, another options. If you just right click 
here, trim start or trim end. I mean, there are other options not so common to use. So these are the most uh, used ways in Grasshopper. There is another one that sometimes is it worth to use it, but let's say it's too complicated. It's called cross-reference, cross-reference, OK? Let's see what it's doing. I'm just doing the same process. So just connect these cables. I mean, don't worry about this messy stuff. This amount of cables here is not important to you just to, to look at it faster. And you see, it's connected absolutely all the points all together. And you see, they are generating a lot of data, a lot of lines, right? I mean, sometimes, probably if you watch a tutorial or something, maybe they're using cross-reference. But as you can see, it's so complicated, it's still generating so much information that is not very uh, common to use, OK? Of course, uh, I forgot to tell you, I mean, there are many things to, to, to explain here in Grasshopper, but if you want to uh, look for where is the component uh, I'm explaining, there is a shortcut. So if you use Control, you press the keys, Control, Alt, the same time, and select the component, it's telling you where is located and where is the icon, OK? Just in case that you are interested. So for example, the line. Control Alt and then select the line component and it's telling you where it is. Okay, just in case that you want to use in that way. Okay. And you I'm using the search keyboard because I find it quite useful when we have um, just a few uh, minutes to explain this these tools. Okay. So I hope you can grasp a little bit about this longest list because I, it's really important to understand in a more complicated exercise. So for example, coming back to the Please, I'm going to, or just open the file here, but I'm going to uh, go back to the to the exercise. We we already worked um, last week here. The points, I mean, you can move out, you can delete them. I mean, this here is not important in this exercise. So I'm going to hide them. One second. OK. So remember, I have this polygonal table, um, the rectangle we are playing with, and so on, right? So, in this case, probably I'm interested in, and I'm, I'm, we are using like a, this exercise to, to to explain about learning outdoor spaces. So, how to convert this table? I'm going to maybe with eight uh, segments is a lot. Let's use four, just four. So, how to convert this into a classroom? Okay, I'm using this table for you know to uh, to to use and to 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 create more geometry with that. So. I'm going to explain here with this company, Square. A square, square is creating a square grid. So I'm able to locate more tables, to place more, more tables in, in my scripting. Okay, so Square, let's see what's going on because there, I have a very tiny you know, solution here in Zito. But what it's doing, I have to customize a little bit the square, the square grid. So first of all is the size of the cell, right? So that's the size is one, that's why it's so small. I can use a panel to uh, to put a you know a bigger number here, right? So remember, call a panel and just maybe 150, 150 units is good enough for the size of the square. Watch out if you have Rhino 6, don't press Enter. OK, that's important. So you, you see, I have a larger square grid here of 150 units. And by default, you see 5 by 5 elements, OK, 5 by 5. So you can remember that putting a number here is a way to you know customize a little bit your um, grid, square grid, right? So just put a couple of them. So later on, I'm you know I can I can increase or decrease my future classroom. Okay, that's it. So the result, the output, what I have here is cells and points. I'm interested in the points. The cells are just the rectangles, the output. So if you can add the points, let me make some space here. And I'm going to, I'm not using the rectangle right now. I'm going to use the polygon curve here. So if you can add the points location, 
with the polygon that is using the 0, 0 by default. When you connect, this is the location of my of my table, of my, of my point. If you connect the point location, the different origins I have here with a plane, let's see what's going on. Just connecting that, and you see, automatically I have as many tables and intersections I have here, right? Why is doing that? Because I'm using longest list. Remember, I have here one polygon shape, one polygon curve, and I have here, I don't know, uh, 48, 48 points is working the longest list. I get 48 tables, okay? That's very important to understand. That's the reason I have so many in a matter of seconds. But let's play a little bit what's going on if I want to complicate a little bit of complicated things here, right? Let's create uh, a variable shape. So if one table is a square, another table is a triangle, another is a pentagon. So different segments on these tables, right? So, and this is a good opportunity, a good chance to explain random, random components. It's very common in Grasshopper because when you want to, you, you know, create uh, variable designs, variable geometry in a fast way, you can use random. That is very similar to the shuffle that you have in Spotify when you, you know, play some music in a random style. This is doing something like that. It's like just playing with an algorithm and changing a little bit the the, the solutions. So you you get a kind of random uh, uh, solution, random output. So let's call the random first of all. So I'm going to just type here outside. First of all, I'm going to focus in in see how it works. Random. So random, you know, there is a cat. The icon is a cat on a box. And it's not because of the, you know, they are cat lovers and so on. It's because of the uh, this Schrodinger paradox. OK, if you have heard about that, it's, you know, it's a kind of paradox in uh, metaphysics at the end because, you know, random is connected, it's in a box and connected with a poison. And at the end, there is a paradox that the cat is live and, and death at the same time. OK, but if you don't know about it, just go to Wikipedia and they will explain you a little bit about this random thing. So the random is not so random. Everybody has these number, this very long number, 0 0.77 and so on, right? Why is doing this? Well, the most important thing is to understand these three inputs here. First of all, the range, probably is the most important one. Range is, OK, I'm telling you the random, to look for a random number between 0 and 1. That's my limits, my domain, OK? This is very important. So I'm telling you, OK, give me a random value between 0 and 1. And well, how many numbers do you want? And here by default, I have one. So that's the, that's the reason that I have only one number, one random value between uh, zero and one. And let's change this result. So how? There are many ways to do it, but to make it faster. Again, a panel is very, very useful in Grasshopper. So with a panel, again, I can look for a panel here. Or if you have activated here, this is a kind of a smart tool smart toolbar in this lower right corner is helping you i mean this is up to you know the number of hours you are training with Rasober is you know understanding that maybe you need a number a panel sorry maybe you need a slider so it's, it's giving you some shortcuts to uh reach the components so the panel i'm going to use a panel not for that for an mean for a domain so let's put between zero to 10, for example. Don't press enter, especially for Rhino 6 users. 0 to 10. And connect that. And using another panel, so I can call, for example, and yes, instead of having just one number, I'm, I'm going to generate 10 numbers. So, so what is doing inside here? So use another panel. The panel in the output is just to see the results. So here I have a list of numbers, 10 numbers, because I told you so, 10 numbers, between 0 and 10, random values. So you see all these random elements are values between these domains, right? And um, what about the seed? The seed, it's like a factor. Any number you put here 
is in charge of altering, of changing the uh, results. So let's say it's like a factor that you know uh, goes into the, the algorithm, into the formula inside the random component and change everything. So it's very easy to, to see that if you put just uh, a slider, so that's the reason if you put that, everybody has different values, okay? So the random is more, let's say, random. Okay. You see, when I change the factor, I get different results, okay? So this is how random works. Of course, maybe I'm using the, the random here in the segment. So let's customize, so you can put this random just below, just to explain a little bit how it works. So let's make a special random for my different tables. So I'm, I was telling you that I want tables uh, from, I don't know, the range could be from triangles to, I don't know, octagons, whatever. So let's create a random here. Just explain a little bit. Again, so here the range is important because if I put from zero to eight, for example, probably I get results closer to zero or closer to one, which is no sense to use in a polygon shape, right? So the minimum domain, the minimum value is to generate triangles, triangles, right? So three should be the range I'm using, the minimum value to eight sides, okay? So these, is our, these are going to be the sides or my uh, table shape. Okay, from three to eight, that's the range. And the number, well, I will explain you a little bit more about it, but there, right now I have 48 values, right? I have 48 points, so I should have 48 numbers here, the same amount of random uh, values. So let's put 48. I'm going to use an Arpano or copy and paste and 48 numbers and the seed again is just a factor so it's just to give you different results okay different results it's like a disco playing a lot with uh with uh with the shapes in this case right so um about the question yeah let me let me uh finish this part and, and probably we can we can go there yeah so um let's connect this random and let's see what's going on i don't know what's going on here just to check that before the connection so i have many elements and well for sure these numbers are not the total segments the total size right but uh what is doing grasshopper is making a run up or run down to get for example 4.9 is going to make a pentagon or if it's going 7.3, maybe it's going to seven segment size. If you don't like that, these big numbers, you can just, I'm going to delete this panel. You can just go to, or leave it like one second. So you can just right click on the random, right click, and you can activate integer numbers. So automatically make a round of these values to get just integer numbers. But it's not really important. If you just connect directly, it's going to work fine too. Okay. So, um, what is this? Segments, right? And what I have here, always the same number, right? If you recognize the scripting, if you recognize the scripting here, you see I'm changing to five, six, and so on, right? So let's substitute this always this same number into a random values here, right? So I'm going to connect this one to the segments. Okay. Maybe it takes a little bit. And maybe your computer crashes. I'm sorry about that. It depends on your computer. If it's a very old computer, maybe it takes you a lot of time to calculate. I'm sorry about that. But um, you see, I was expecting I have a failure here. Something is not working good. And unfortunately, this is very common in Grasshopper. So when you you know connect some cables here and say, oh, this is not so random, you see, that's it's always five elements in this horizontal distribution and then six or seven 
and then triangles so it's not so random and then there is a kind of messy thing here you know there are many tables over here and the result you know i have 48 random values i have uh 48 points and the result here is 384 wow that's crazy right i wasn't i wasn't expecting so so how to solve that and this is because of the data management again when you have these situations it's something that it's not understanding well in the data thing okay So let's go to to explain this in into um, simpler exercises. It's not really important if you follow it if you try to do it in your computer. I mean, probably it's better to understand just looking at your at, at my screen to see how it works. So I'm going to open a new file just to a new grasshopper file and try to repeat the situation here. So in a simpler way. So I have the square remember uh, a very small uh, size like uh, you know I know and this just put a slider in here just a very very small square grid two by one it's something for here you see something very small or two by one over here and in this point, instead of a uh, uh, table, I'm sorry, um, using a sphere, instead of using a table uh, we were creating before, sphere. That's a sphere. You see, now it's working fine. I have a sun and everything is, is, is smooth because of the longest list. Remember, I have six points. It's very clear to recognize as in the in the screen and have six spheres but let's change something that i have in my in my table scripting let's change that into a more complicated um situation with variable radius i'm not using the random i'm just using a panel i could use a panel with some values here and this, this is very important thing to in grasshopper so pay, pay attention to that so i'm creating a random values watch out because the my size here on the square is 10 the size of the square grid so i'm using uh two uh five i don't know four three one maybe yeah i have and another value right two i'm going to repeat oh, sorry i'm going to repeat this one these are a kind of random values for my sphere so if you can add these elements to the radius the result is totally red and this is important and generally talking in English, um is not understanding what is going on here it requires a list of elements and this is just a plain numbers put in there with some enters and lines so the grasshopper doesn't understand this information how to uh, convert these elements into a list is and this is very important right click right click on the panel and choose change that to multi-line data multi-line data here so this uh, option is converting these elements into of data you see the list number zero and then there is a location for the number two, a location for the number five, a location for the number four, and so on. Okay, you see at least, I mean, the result is not so good right now, but at least I have seen I have something uh, that works in the sphere. But you see, I have the similar situation that uh, I have in my tables design, right? A lot of uh, you know multiple copy spheres in these um, location points. So this is because of the cable and the data list management. So I talk, I talk, I told you before in the last uh, session that uh, something going on with the cables. And this is today I'm going to explain that. There are three kinds of tables, uh, of cables, sorry, of cables. The, the um, let's say the simplest one is this one. You see, it's a simple cable. Is taking only one data, one element, 
and play with that in a component. So just one element in a list. This is the simplest cable option. You see, it's a very thin line here. This next level in the cable display is this double cable. If you have a Mac, uh, um, a Rhino for Mac, it's a thicker cable. It's not double, but it's, it's thicker, the display. So the double cable means that it's taking more elements, more data in one list. So in this list zero, more elements here, double cable. This is very common to play with. And especially when you are a beginner, it's, I'm not telling you this is bad, or it's, 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 a, it's a bad idea to play with it, but watch out with that. Be careful when you are in, in the, you know, the first steps in, in Grasshopper. Dash cables. Dash cables, they are the most sophisticated ones. So if you just put a panel here just to see what's going on. You have multiple list of elements here, list of three lists at the end. These uh, darker areas is the, is the list elements with more data in these lists. Okay, so you have, let's say, one box, and inside this box, you have more boxes. Okay, so it's a more sophisticated way with play, uh, uh, to play with data. And I told you how Grasshopper works by default, longest list, right? So let's compare. And that's the problem here. I'm putting together, I'm putting um a dash cable in the input with a double cable here and let's let's see what it's doing i'm going to compare these two points focus on the coordinates which is easier i guess if you go to the first coordinate zero zero the origin you know it's making a, a sphere of radius okay. um if you go to the um scan, so this corner here and that's the problem, the longest list, right? I have just two elements, and this list is comparing with this list with more elements. So it's repeating all this information, a sphere, radius 5, 4, 3, 1, 2, and so on. If I have 1,000 elements here, it's going to make 1,000 spheres over there. When it goes to the next list, so 10, 0, and I can I cannot change that. This is the way how it's creating this component, how it works. So the 10 zero, this coordinate point, it repeats again. It, it starts again to the first element, a radius of two. And again, in the 10, 10, this coordinate is repeating the next remaining data I have here. And so on and so on. And that's the problem. When you combine, let's say, dashes cable with double cables and so on, and they don't have the same elements, it's a problem here. And this is, I'm using here a pencil just to, you know, just, just to, to explain you here. The way Grasshopper has this component is, and that's why it's called like a tree elements i have i'm sorry i have some troubles here with my so i'm going to yeah i'm going to use it here much better so this is how it works the square grid component so you have the list zero zero so it comes from the zero and then the list number zero one and zero two okay you have branches there and the other is just going with a double cable, the least zero. So that's why it's combining the first one to this one. And if you don't have the same number of elements, it's repeating a lot. So how to avoid problems, especially when you are a beginner. So take out the the brand, the, uh, the tree, remove the tree. I don't want so complicated distribution. So cut the tree, so you can cut these branches and everything is going is let's say everything is going using the trunk. So you are converting into a double cable, just using the trunk. Every, all the information, the information you have here, here, and here, they go together in the same list. So, well, this is a good moment to explain you, explain you, um, flatten, okay? So let's see. I'm going to explain it here. So if you just go to call flatten, you see the icon is quite funny. 
is cutting the tree, you know, this distribution of branches and different listing sites. So let's see before the flatten and after the flatten. So if you can add the flatten of these points, and then I put another panel to see what's going on here, you see the cable becomes double cable and all these coordinates I have separated, distributed in different, in different branches, they are going together in the same list. So I'm sure that in this case, it's going to work fine. So you have, let's say, six elements, six coordinates. I have six um, radius here. So I'm sure that after that, you can connect with a panel or maybe it's a smoother to connect with the output solution. You see, after the flatten, everything works fine. I'm getting, you know, the spheres properly, six points, six spheres. Okay. I hope you can start understanding. And I don't promise this is easy. It's not easy to understand this because you are not get used to work with this kind of data management. But at least I hope you start getting a little bit of Grasshopper. Okay. So if you, I hope you can understand a little bit. If you come back to the to my table scripting, going back here. This is the same very similar situation. So if you make a flatten here, you avoid using these vertical columns distribution. It's like dividing the the my square grid in columns, in list of columns. I'm going to make a flatten. And it's it's so common to, to make a flatten that you don't have to use the same component, the flatten component. You can just right click here or here. In this case, it's not important in the input or the output, and then right click and then put a you know uh, uh, this uh, icon the the arrow down flatten so automatically make a flatten here and you get a double cable and everything is smoother okay and if you, ch if you change the the seed of the random you see different you know, you know random tables Okay. Okay. Another thing is because I'm, we are using uh, outdoor learning spaces, right? So the last thing, the last uh, topic I, I need to cover here, it's let's change the number of the random elements. If I put, okay, I, I need to put, I don't know, 20 random values. Let's see what happens. Well, here is where I'm getting like a random elements, but in this other corner, in this other area, you see that it's in the same. Why? Again, and this is the goal today, longest list. I have 48 point locations here. I didn't change that. And I have 20 values only. So the last element, the last random I have here in my situation, I have six uh, as the last element of my random list is going to repeat until it finishes the la the longest list I'm using. Okay, so how to solve this situation? And this is a very clever uh, component uh, to explain here. It's um, list length. Okay, list length. I'm going to make some space here just to explain it. List length. Cool. It's very useful. And I, I guess very easy to understand. It's like going to the super, when you go to the supermarket, right? And you you buy I don't know uh, milk, uh, paper toilet, whatever you have. Uh, at the end, is giving you the receipt in the final ticket. Is giving you uh, you know the the items you have bought, but the total number of islands. Okay, you have bought twenty elements of this list, and so on. so the list length is doing exactly that. It's understanding how much elements you have here. So in the points, it doesn't care about the coordinates of the points. So it's just giving you the number of elements you have here, 48. You know, it's like measuring the total number of elements. So this is very important because 
instead of trying to change all the time, if I have here 48 and make sure that here I have 48 elements, 48 random values, always the same in order not to repeat the, 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 the last element, is updating all the time. It's getting update information, updated information of the elements I have here. So instead of using always the same number here, I'm going to remove that and use as many numbers you have. So it's updating the information all the time. 48, great. So 48 random values. I'm not going to failure anymore here. I'm using all this the same amount here. If I'm, you know, my classroom is a smaller, don't worry. I just go here, make a smaller classroom, go to the points and calculate automatically to get the same number of random values. Okay, so I got always random elements. If my classroom is larger I, or is in mar, more horizontal way and so on, automatically updates all the time. Okay, so very, very important element or very important component to use in your scripting, this list length, okay, is to update information. And the last thing I'm going to explain uh, today. Okay, I'm using outdoor learning spaces and sometimes these ones, these spaces are not so fixed and not so regular, okay? Are not so square or rectangular shapes. So let's create, you know, what's going on if I have uh, my area to, you know, to cover with tables here for make has this shape, okay? So make a curve, control point curve here on Rhino. And I'm going to say, okay, this is my area to cover here with tables. I don't want to use these tables outside these elements, okay? And that's my, my last topic to cover today. And I'm, I'm getting more complicated stuff here, right? So I, I want to make more space over here just to explain a little bit. So in this case, I need to read, let me, get one more space on this area, okay? So I need to read, first of all, the curve in Grasshopper because this curve is in Rhino. So I'm going to collect the curve. We already know how to do that with this component curve. Right-click, right-click, and set one curve. Great. And, well, I need to tell Grasshopper to understand what is inside the curve and outside the curve. And there is a very interesting component in these situations that is point in curve. Point in curve. This one, the other is, is for multiple curves. Don't watch out because there are a very similar component. Point in curve. And there is point in curves. Okay, this is for multiple curves. I'm, I'm using the the this one, point in curve. So this is comparing this information. Okay, so I have curves here. That's my curve, and that's my points. Okay, and let's see which is the relationship. So it's comparing the data. It's comparing the elements, the coordinates I have here, and it's telling me based on this very similar to, to programming language, based on these numbers. See, though, it's outside the curve, elements outside the curve, one coincident that they are on the curve and two inside the curve with these numbers. Zero is for you know telling you this information and two probably is the most interested, the inside elements I have. So how to extract, how to separate these numbers. So very um, link component here, I'm using sift pattern. Okay, sift pattern is going to separate a list of elements, this is a relationship. I have only here, you see, I have here only just this data with a panel to explain. Here I have just zero or two because it's very, you know, very weird that maybe my point is exactly, sorry, my point is exactly on, in the curve, right? So I have only zero and two values. So how to separate this information? Well, I get this relationship into the sift pattern. This is telling you here, you have a 0, 1, 2, very common in Grasshopper, also 0, 1 only. So this is my sift pattern, the relationship. 
and the list of elements I want to separate are the points. Okay, so I need to connect again the points here. Separate the zero, the one, and so on. It's still orange. You see, this is still, it's still like not giving you all the information. Well, in this situation, as I have zero, one, and two values, zero, one, and two possibilities, zoom in because there are many components in Grasshopper. When zoom in here, you have a plus button. That means that you can extract more output information or uh, um, remove information. Okay, in this case, if you click on this plus button, see, automatically it becomes gray because you know it was missing the output number two. Okay, so zoom in and press the, I mean, if you press more, the others are totally empty, three, four, because my sieve pattern is going from zero to two, okay? So I'm going to stay here, zero, one, and two, and I'm going to work with the number two elements. If you don't see that, just put a geometry. Remember, the geometry component is absolutely for everything. So geometry is telling you, more or less, you see, it's telling you this elements are the ones inside of the of the of the list and these ones are the ones outside of the list so i'm playing only with the number two just remove this one second so the number two this is me the output the output so again this very is just complicated things but instead of working with all the points here with all the points, what I need is to work with the only with the elements inside. So the ones that they are going in the two output here, in this output. So this location just connect with the plane here. Instead of using all the points, you see the connection, the points are going to the polygon and so on, and just connecting this one, right? So you see. I have, I'm working only with the elements inside of my curve. If you want to see what's going on with the zero, if you can add the zero, you have random tables outside of this curve. Of course, maybe I need to work with the, with the ones inside. And the good things of Grasshopper is that when you change this curve, say, okay, I want to make it, you know, the control points and so on, want to make a different shape here, it's going to detect everything and get a random distribution of this list. Or if you move this curve and put it here, you have the classroom is working only on this area. So it's another way, instead of using, you know, this kind of more orthogonal uh, distribution, uh, try to isolate to, you know, to work with a certain area of your geometry you have here, okay? So this is the most important thing since you want to work with this uh, isolation geometry. So I guess I have no time, unfortunately. So um, I know this is rough. This is not uh, easy to understand the list management, but at least to have a first, con a first point of contact with this information. And I'm sorry, guys, that this is the way Grasshopper deals with the management of data. That's the key. As I told you the first, you know, the first day, this set, we have worked today with some elements on the list, you know, longest list, shortest list, and so on, with some sequences, random, right? And something that is the most complicated thing is the tree elements, right? And we have cut the tree. We have used a flattened tree to simplify things, okay? So I hope you enjoyed this short session and waiting for the for uh, Professor Aaron Julius to, to, to know a little bit more about uh, outdoor learning spaces. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Architect Sergio, for that very informative discussion about Rhino and Grasshopper. Now, it's interesting to see how the procedural workflow uh, interacts with Grasshopper and Rhino. So if you're not uh, familiar with procedural, it's, it's about managing the data, connecting the nodes, and it gets di displayed in Rhino. Now, to our participants in our YouTube live stream, you may type your questions. If you have questions, just type it in uh, the chat box below.
So here we have a question from from Zhao Guggenheim. Are those instances type copies? Those those tables. I think he was referring to the tables. Um. Yeah. Somehow, yes, if we understand instances uh, uh, as the um, uh, comparing with copies, the instances, the, the good thing is that you, when you alter the information, the instance copy automatically updates that information. It's kind of a smart copy, let's say, right? This is what I understand as in, instance. And yeah, somehow it's, it's something like that. Yeah, it's, it's, but the most important thing is why is understanding why is, is copy is getting instances of the geometry because of the longest list combination. If you have just one element, for example, one hexagon, and you have 1,000 location points, it's like using the longest list to connect to the 1,000 points. Okay, so it's somehow an instance. It's not really exactly like that, but yeah, it's more related with the data list management rather than uh, understanding as an instance copy. Now, just to follow up with the question, the instance meaning uh, if you copy the object multiple times, the memory doesn't get duplicated multiple times, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because it's using all the time only the the component calculating. Yeah, it's not calculating per component. Yeah, that's that's correct. It's 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 a speeding up the process. It's not getting so slow the computer. Yeah, that's another way to to see it like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. understood. All right. So thank you for that question. So just like the behavior in 3ds Max, right? Um, I'm, I'm not an expert in 3D Max. I used a lot of years ago on 3D Max, but because uh, the instance, I know that 3D Max and other softwares, they call it usually, or V-Ray, for example, they call some elements uh, to use as instance. But I think it's another different way and another different structure. I, I really don't know how, how it works inside 3D Max. Maybe it's a good question for 3D Max developers, how they use the instance over there in that software. But I think it's another different way to to understand it. Yeah. Yeah, they may they may have a different term for it, but I think it's mm -hmm. also instance. Also mm -hmm. the so in the software I use Blender. We also but use different instances. <laughs> the output, the solution is the, the logic is quite similar, the concept at the end. I mm -hmm. think it's quite mm -hmm. similar. Yeah. So I think it's present in the more advanced softwares such as this Rhino, uh, the smart way to go is instance instead of copying or duplicating your object multiple times over and over again. Mm -hmm. All right, so while waiting for another another uh, another question here, I, I, I do have a question. Uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm interested to know uh, regarding the naming convention Rhino and Grasshopper, would you have any idea why it's named Rhino and Grasshopper? Why? Why? But then, sorry, because the the the, the sound was cut a little bit. Um, oh yeah. Why the, uh, the names? Me, You're saying the, the names. Yeah, the the names, Rhino and Grasshopper. Would you know the well, story behind it? Well, I, the, in the first session, I explained the name uh, Grasshopper because of the mm -hmm. Grace Hopper, computational designer, that she nice. was uh, one of the pioneers in the in the in the field. So that's the, the it was a kind of playing word and also because most of the as you know the plugins and software apps for grasshopper and rhino they come with animals so i think it's all just playing a little bit with the words and rhino i think is not so uh, wonderful story if i'm not wrong it's because the first uh, the first thing they 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 uh they 3d model was a rhino shape mm -hmm. and it was like that say okay let's call it rhino i think so it was something <laughs> not so you know, uh, spectacular in the background, something like that. So, well, I do find it interesting, though. <laughs> uh, all right, so we have, I think, last question from Zhao Guggenheim again. Uh, quite confused with the relationship with the proxies. I think relating to the previous question he had. Could you could you put that? So maybe now we we'll was start. Oh with yeah, you. we we do have this. Uh, all right. Uh, let's answer the first question first. With Please the proxies, with the relationship with the proxies. Uh, but 
with the proxies. Um, ah, yeah, instances. because the proxies, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was trying to think about, yeah, it's also something in V-Ray that they're using V-Ray yeah. proxies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, as far as I know, the, 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 when, when I have used proxies, like in 3D Max and V-Ray, yeah, I was trying to think about the proxies thing. And it's a different, again, it's a different concept. It's something just to, let's say, to, to make a light copy element of the original one or convert into a light, in this case, a light mesh uh, to optimize the render process in V-Ray. This is what I know about proxies. And this is not exactly, it's just playing with, you know, rough data inside. It's just playing with uh, programming language and, and try to use that combination to speed up the process. So the concept, I think the base concept is not the same, the purpose of the proxies and the instances and so on, but, uh, but the result is something similar because at the end it's trying to save information, try to save memory to your computer. Mm -hmm. So that's why I told you in the first session that the grasshopper is a kind of parasite uh, for Rhino because it's not using and it's not using the visual information. It's just to display it what you have in Grasshopper, but that's the reason that it's so fast to to show the copy elements and so on. So I think the the output, let's say, is something similar. The input, how it's built inside, is not the same proxies and instances and so on. But I'm not a developer, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So but this, I think, is question more for developers. The, the guys that they are programming in Rhino and Grasshopper, yeah. Well, for those who are not familiar with the term proxy, it's being used by advanced softwares in order to save memory into, yeah. you know, just to, uh, for example, if your, compu compu your computer cannot handle such uh, many geometries, it will display a proxy character, yeah. a proxy object, instead of the large uh, volume uh, for example, large, large size object. So that's a proxy. Yeah, well, imagine anyway, a tree, a tree mm -hmm. with leaves. So every mm -hmm. leaves is going to be very heavy for for management in the computer. So the proxy is a very nice idea to play with a full tree, not a, not tree in grasshopper, a real tree, you know, vegetation. And so, so yeah, that's that's it. But it's a very advanced question. Yeah, that's that's mm -hmm. good to know. Yeah, may we know where to start between Python and grasshopper? Um, Python is a more advanced, I mean, Python is just if you want to go to pure language programming. So, I mean, it's something, of course, you, you need to like a lot these <laughs> programming languages. And that's why Grasshopper is there for those, including me, that we don't like a lot programming. And, and there are many plugins and many apps in Grasshopper, so it's not necessary to run into Python. The Python is when you want to do something that you can, it's not possible mm -hmm. because there are no tools in Grasshopper or there is no plugin in Grasshopper to solve this situation, then you, you just go to Python because you just program what you really, what you really want to do. But uh, I think my suggestion is try to you know, to enjoy Grasshopper first. And if you are, you know, if you have covered a lot of things and you, ha you haven't found the, the solution in Grasshopper, maybe it's time to run into Python, but which is really cool. But again, it's language programming, it's coding. All right. So just to, uh, to answer, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, that's correct. Uh, you do not need Python. No, at all. If you're trying to learn Grasshopper right now. All right, so I think we need to move on to our next presentation. But before that, we'll be having a short break. So thank you, Architect Sarah, for that, uh, for that, for answering the, those questions and enlightening uh, enlightening us more about Rhino and Grasshopper. So let's have a short break. Let's grab a cup of coffee and sit back and enjoy the show. All right, all right. So I was informed that. We will not be having a break anymore. So, all right. Uh, without further ado, let's go to our next presenter, Professor Aaron. Now, I'd like to remind everyone, if you wish to get your certificate of attendance to this online seminar, type in your name, your affiliation, and location in the comment sections of this live stream. And also, if you have questions, just type it in immediately, and we'll be reading those uh, in our Q&A portion. 
Now let's welcome our next lecturer, Professor Aaron Julius Lesiones for his presentation about out outdoor learning spaces. Hello and good morning, everyone. So I will be presenting about outdoor learning spaces and let me share my screen. All right, so I hope everyone can see this. Okay, so let's start. So, uh, again, good morning. I'm Aaron Lekshanes, and I will be presenting a short introduction on outdoor learning spaces. I'm currently an assistant professor and director for the extension program at the College of Architecture at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. I am also a member of the Urban Design Studio Lab and Architectural Communication Studio Lab at the College of Architecture. Uh, is it moving? All right, there. So I want to talk about outdoor learning spaces. First, what are outdoor learning spaces? Where do, you, where do we find these types of spaces? Who are its users? Second, why outdoor learning spaces? What can we learn from them? What are their benefits? Third, are there outdoor learning spaces for higher education? How do they look like? How did they make them? And lastly, <clears throat> fourth, what are the basic design considerations for outdoor learning spaces? We begin with what are, <clears throat> excuse me, what are outdoor learning spaces? Outdoor learning spaces are any place where meaningful experiences can be had in and with nature <clears throat> and the environment. Originally, outdoor learning spaces were geared towards learning environments that nurtured an emotional connection with nature. And also, originally, it was geared towards younger students who benefited greatly in developing deep, lifelong appreciation for the natural world and how our human systems depended on it. Usually, learning outdoors meant understanding topics that were manifestly obvious outdoors, such as topics on birds, the water cycle, food webs, and others. However, outdoor spaces has also become a great place to learn about important topics such as public health, environmental awareness, and the role of society and nature. Many of the original goals of outdoor learning spaces focused on the positive behavioral change towards the environment as a result of the lasting impression, emotional connections, and a deeper level of understanding that comes with immersion outdoors. Today, outdoor learning places are anywhere students or adults can experience nature in a way that fosters the awareness and connection that leads to this understanding and respect. But is it just about only the environment? It is not, but the environment plays a big role in the unique benefits provided by outdoor learning environments. Outdoor learning spaces have shown to provide academic gains, especially in social science, mathematics, and the arts. A study in 2016 funded by Natural England demonstrated numerous short and long-term benefits of outdoor learning, ranging from more engagement and less stress to improved physical and psychological well-being. Students were happier and enjoyed their lessons more. Teachers reported positive impacts on their teaching practice and reported higher job satisfaction. Outdoor learning was also seen to improve cognition, attention, and engagement in learning. Although most of the research conducted for outdoor learning spaces in the past come from studies on young children, the same benefits for students and the concept used are being applied for secondary and even post-secondary education. 
Outdoor spaces offer many opportunities to extend learning. Research, such as those by the American Institutes of Research or the Greater Good Science Center at the University of California, Berkeley, suggests that there are both educational and health-related re benefits to learning outdoors. For instance, breathing fresh air can clear students' minds and help them think by increasing the amount of oxygen their brains receive. Being outside can also reduce stress and improve students' emotional well-being. Students are more motivated and retain information longer. These same techniques used for outdoor learning spaces are becoming more useful for higher education, especially in light of what, man, what many colleges and universities are experiencing during this COVID pandemic. So this article asks the question we are all hoping to answer. Can outdoor learning help educational institutions transition to hybrid learning where in-person instruction would be less of a risk? With social distancing guidelines in place, many schools and libraries are looking outside for additional learning space. With the many benefits of outdoor learning spaces, they can be a great supplement to current indoor classrooms of schools, colleges, and universities. Outdoor classes have long been used, or outdoor classrooms have long been used as a response to earlier pandemics. In this article, the New York Times looks at how New York City in the early years of the 20th century used outdoor classes to combat the ravages of tuberculosis that was spreading across American cities. Following success in educational trends in Germany, two doctors implemented open air school rooms to mitigate the transmission of the disease. No student in their classrooms got sick. Another New York Times article looks at schools that have already started using their outdoor spaces for learning, reusing basketball courts and any open field for classroom space. One problem the students had though was that I was usually not available or too weak in these new learning spaces. For us in hotter climates, one big concern would be the availability of shade and cool air. In some univers universities, like the UP de Liman campus, finding shade in a nice natural environment isn't such a big problem. Though, however, for others, it can be. No matter though the outdoor space, learning outdoors when done right is a break, not only under the sun, as in the caption in the picture, shown, but the change in atmosphere from a virtual world of learning that students can welcome. So how else can outdoor learning space look like? We know that outdoor learning spaces can be used for hands-on experiential learning of nature itself, but it could, also it could also use nature as the backdrop to a conducive learning environment. Outdoor learning spaces are outdoor classrooms, simply spaces set up for group learning outdoors. During this COVID-19 pandemic, and especially as we take action to create a better normal and transition into hybrid learning approaches, what is most urgently relevant is that outdoor classrooms could give students and teachers that alternative space to conduct classes in person. In a space, spread out with ample space to breathe, read, write, talk, and think together. As a reaction, many local governments and institutions have released guidelines on the design of outdoor learning spaces, all to address the challenge to reimagine and be creative with outdoor spaces as a way to support the safe return to in-person instruction given the lower risk of virus transmission outdoors. One example is the Outdoor Learning Environments Design Guidelines developed by HMC Architects for the Los Angeles County Office of Education, where their aim was not just to facilitate short-term solutions in relation to the COVID pandemic, such as those to support the return to in-person instruction, but to reinforce the momentum towards learning environments that enhance student success, wellness, and community. As many educational institutions shifted teaching online, increasing their use of technology 
a host of new problems emerged, from issues in mental health to issues of the excessive amount of physical screen time. The need for learning spaces outdoors has become more appealing due to their benefits that deal with these issues. But where are these outdoor learning spaces? Outdoor learning spaces can be parks. Again, some campuses have much more of these green open spaces than others, but any park nearby can be used by schools, colleges, and universities as outdoor learning spaces. Nature centers can also be used as outdoor learning centers. Again, we might not have many, but I guess this time is ripe to have more of them. And outdoor learning spaces can be in our schools. And this is where we are now. As part of the Parametric Design and Digital Fabrication Learning Series, a select few of the participants will continue on to a workshop to design furniture for such an outdoor learning space. Although primarily targeted for higher education institutions, the output of these workshops can very well be used for primary and secondary schools. But for the time being, let us look at some examples of what higher education institutions have been doing in terms of making outdoor learning spaces. From the US, such schools as the University of California, Davis, Providence College, the University of Kentucky, and even in campuses in the United Kingdom, there have been a rush to use outdoor learning spaces during this pandemic. Catchy names such as Campus Canopies try to convey a friendly atmosphere of learning and of bringing back life to campuses that have been devoid of life for over a year now. In Providence College, Rhode Island, just like in the University of Kentucky and many other universities across the United States, they make liberal use of tents and collapsible chairs. In the picture above, Dr. Kevin O'Connor, an associate professor at Providence College, teaches a course on education on the Smith Center Quad on a warm November day. This is fine, all things considered, but as makeshift the classroom is, as fleeting this setup will be too. Since how acceptable would, would pitching a tent at the quad be year round? Designing outdoor learning spaces needs to integrate with its surroundings so that it can be left there without looking like a sore thumb. Here is another setup at Providence College, this time for teaching language instruction. A certain Dr. Bernhoff is teaching English at, the, at their college's Hickey Hall Observation Deck. Again, the different elements of the outdoor classroom, shade, seating, table, can be better or creatively conceptualized using parametric design so that they become more part of the place. Outdoor furniture that is active, dynamic, multifunctional. How about a seat that can act as a table or even as a wall for extra shape? Providence College uses all their outdoor space, which is sprinkled around their college to teach. We can do the same in our campuses. The picture on the left is Assistant Professor Lynn Curtis, who is teaching drawing fundamentals near an outdoor space in one of their halls. While the picture on the right shows another associate professor teaching digital photography for several students who elected to attend in person, as well as for others who are viewing remotely. Again, we see more use of tents, this time for college students who are part of a concert chorale. Outdoor learning spaces can also be used for other activities other than formal classroom learning. At the top right are students dancing during a hip hop dance class at a specialized outdoor tent, this time at Ohio State University. A more permanent structure for outdoor learning called the Calabria Pavilion, also found at Providence College, 
Here, college students are being taught an introduction to a literature class. However, notice the chairs and the lack of table space. We can compare that with these learning pods at the University of Wollongong in Australia. These learning pods rely on trees for shade, providing much more connection with nature and all the benefits that come with it. With seating that is much more a part of the landscape and with pods that provide both a space that functions as a table, also as a storage, seating, and outlets to power devices. Although these learning pods are used for informal learning, these adaptations can be employed and reconfigured in designs for use in more structured learning formats. This is another view of those learning pods. Spreading out outdoor learning spaces for both formal and informal instruction, designs that accommodate both small informal groups as well as large formal classes across pockets of open green space around the campus. These are where parametric design can be put to good use in designing creative and responsive outdoor learning spaces. Here are more examples of their learning pods uh, at the University of Wollongong. And that is the view of the same. So you can see the designs they made, how it blends with nature, how it uses the shade, uh, natural shade produced by the tree, how it is situated in the environment. And another example, and this time around, it incorporates the use of uh, a, a man-made body of water. Yes. So very interesting place to uh, have outdoor learning class. So again, we go to another school in the US, this time Indiana University. Here, as you can see from the pictures on the left, they once again use tents. These are understandably temporary outdoor classrooms. The same goes for Rice University, which pitch tents in their open spaces, as can be seen in the picture at the lower right. Will they be replacing these with more permanent and well-integrated versions? Other institutions such as William and Mary in Virginia are doing just that, planning more permanent change by designing more outdoor learning spaces and continuing to add permanent outdoor furniture around campus to encourage students to hold study meetings and casual gatherings outdoors rather than indoors. Again, these parametric designs could be for something as simple as curved seating for an outdoor learning space amongst a sustainable landscape such as this shown at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Parametric design can also be used, for example, on the pictures on the right, in the picture in the middle on the right, we have the Contemplate Pavilion uh, in Chicago as well. And we also have the pavilion at the Nature Boardwalk, the lower right picture. So we have a lot of these examples of parametric design being used for pavilions and also for standalone furniture, but making them specific for outdoor learning spaces and higher education is something that I think our uh, participants to the workshops can uh, contribute to. So there are many spaces where we can place these. This is a picture of uh, UP Diliman. Uh, at the left, of course, you see our academic oval. Uh, on the upper right is Betaway, so one of the very used uh, pathways, so much space there to integrate some sort of outdoor learning space. And these better ways in between uh, Melchor Hall and Palma Hall, one of the main buildings in the campus. 
And also, of course, we have the sunken garden, lots of open space there as well. So your parametric designs, uh, parametric designs for furniture and other accessories to outdoor learning spaces can both be permanently integrated into the landscape or as uh, portable as well. So again, there are many spaces where we can place these. We just need to, to design it. So for my last slide, a very short discussion on the basic design considerations for outdoor learning spaces. Evaluate your outdoor learning spaces by making sure that the space and its accessories are safe and the environment is free from preventable risks. You must consider risk zones. So these can be places that flood, places that are not well lit or not seen publicly. We can call these a social, social, socially defensible spaces. You must also consider surfacing, access to shade, weather, and the conditions of materials and equipment, since these influence maintenance and upkeep costs. Consider designs that are simple, that reduce the risk of missing or broken parts, protrusions of nuts and bolts, rusting and chipping, and, sharp, and the re reduction of sharp edges are preferable. Preferable too are designs that use materials that are weatherproof, have low upkeep, and are friendly to the environment. Designs must also be accessible, ergonomic, and usable by people with disabilities. Designs must consider weather, shade, and the comfort of users. Thus, designs that are portable, user customizable, but are free from the risks of theft are preferable. At the same time, your designs must be versatile. They must create the most value out of outdoor space. These should be multi-purpose spaces that can support many different types of activities. Equipping these spaces with a variety of furniture types allows for many users. Choosing agile, Modular furniture that, be, that can be configured in multiple ways makes it simple to convert spaces from one use to another or to create flexible groupings of different sizes. Designs must be comfortable for both formal and informal use. The designs for outdoor learning spaces, the landscape itself, and the furniture or, access or accessories should be comfortable and easily accessible for places to sit down and talk, read, study, or look up information. Outdoor spaces should be furnished with comfortable, appealing seating that draws students to the space and encourages them to stay and talk or do work between classes or after school. And lastly, for outdoor learning to become a reality, students need tools and materials to support continuous learning. The use of technology can augment outdoor learning spaces. Think of provisions for power, renewable energy, the internet, as well as other facilities needed for teaching. These can be simple technologies as well, such as sidewalk chalk for writing on outdoor surfaces or mini whiteboards or handheld clipboards. Consider these designs that integrate these or have a place to hold these accessories. You don't need to use large projection screens all the time. These are just but a few of the design considerations for outdoor learning spaces, and there are many more. So here are some resources about outdoor learning spaces that you can refer to, and we will be sharing this PowerPoint as well as the other slide decks to you for your reference. Thank you very much for listening. And I do hope that you have learned something from this introduction on outdoor learning spaces, especially for those who will be attending and participating in the workshops. All right, thank you, Professor Aaron, for that very timely presentation. Now, it's interesting to see the not so obvious or the indirect benefits of outdoor learning spaces where the students show a significant increase in their cognitive abilities or cognitive performance. 
uh, it also makes sense because intrinsically us humans have evolved to adapt to nature. And it's also inter interesting to me because there's lots of opportunities for us to flex our capabilities in designing parametric structures in this outdoor learning spaces. So we have some questions now in the panel available. All right, so for, from Francis David, how, da, how does this interim infrastructures address utility requirements such as electricity and sanitation? Good question. <laughs> All right, so um, in most of the higher education examples that were presented, a lot of their um, outdoor learning space setups were right beside existing infrastructure already. So that if they needed sanitation, such as toilets, they would just walk to the nearby hall or the near nearby building. Same goes for electricity. They would just extend, extend a, a cable to provide for electricity. But like what was noted in the presentations, most of these were uh, reactionary uh, or responses that were immediate because of the immediate need. What we are looking into is looking at transitioning these temporary outdoor learning spaces into something that is integral. And so one of the examples that we can use for providing infrastructure for power or electricity would be renewable energy. I'm sure a lot of the students listening and even the practitioners can imagine how we can use renewable energy, especially since it's a decentralized type of infrastructure to power devices where outdoor learning spaces are really in the middle of, let's say, nowhere. For example, in UP, putting it in the middle of somewhere, maybe. <laughs> yeah, the thing is Betaway, my example there was Betaway, but with Betaway, there's already lampposts there because uh, most of the spaces that you will be choosing for outdoor learning spaces have to be socially defensible. In other words, they are well lit, they, are they can be seen from, the, from public spaces, and they usually have good foot traffic because that's one of the requirements for safety. Uh, therefore, it's like concomitant. It's, it's by extension, there's usually lampposts there and other infrastructure for lights already. Uh, for sanitation, again, there are many solutions for decentralized sanitation as well. You can use bio toilets, constructed wetlands to, to provide those um, waste management required for disconnected um, infrastructure like toilets. Uh, yeah, so I, I hope that answers your... I think your... I think that's a very clear answer already. So we have another question from Francis David. Are there permits required by the LGE to build and occupy, occupy such infrastructure facilities? Yes, all right. So um, the question. Most of these uh, outdoor learning spaces can qualify as infrastructure that's placed in parks already. So it would undergo, this, undergo the same types of uh, permits required for, let's say, uh, architecture or landscape architecture. I would believe that uh, if, let's say, outside of the higher education system, we would say implement this in... Um, LGUs would implement this in secondary or even primary schools. They'd go through the same process of, of talking with Dep Ed, talking with the local governments to uh, a lot where these spaces would be. And it would go through the same process of um, building permits, uh, mayor's permit, and, and, and other types of permits. Again, it's, it's, it's not like... Um, or again, it's like akin to a playground. You know, it can be classified under that type of typology. So I don't think uh, there would be too much of any problem when it comes to permitting uh, by the LGU. All right. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. that, that's a very clear answer as well. So we still need, uh, based from what I've understood to your uh, answer, sir, uh, we still need due diligence for this right we need yes. to apply for permits of course we need to classify this under 
a certain occupancy yeah. in, in uh, our building code. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, it's an outdoor space. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's it you will be uh, it's like putting up a uh, a bench, <laughs> a bench in the park. Well, just or a follow up to the previous previous question. Uh, would you really consider this as an interim structure or more of already a permanent structure? Okay, so in the examples provided, you can either make it permanent or not permanent. Mm -hmm. It really depends on the campus. Now, if you feel like it is better that the space is totally free, it's just a yard, then you can create parametric design that is, or the parametrically designed furniture that can be collapsible. Uh, architect Serial discuss a lot of these ways that you can curve, 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 Mm -hmm. objects that they can fold you know, and, and other ways to make it easier to bring around. And uh, I, I, I think that at the same time, that very same parametrically designed furniture should be able to function as either if it's portable, a seat, a table, a shading device, uh, many, many options. All right. So and I so think for the permanent, no, okay. no, for the permanent, if they do want to make it permanent, then then yeah, uh, if they believe that this uh, this will be something that will be integrated now into their curriculum, uh, this type of outdoor learning. Remember, we are trying to move towards a hybrid learning approach, and we haven't been using too much of what na the natural environment can offer us. Considering that some campuses like UP Tilaman are really well, you know, bountiful mm -hmm. when it comes to green open space, so that's something that we can do. I can uh, definitely see the potential of this. Yeah, other examples, for example, in uh, if you go to, let's say, Taft Avenue, there's a lot of schools there, but it's urbanized. But we have examples already in the United States where they just use the rooftops as their outdoor learning spaces. But again, we need to create, we need to design the, the custom built or purpose fit uh, furniture mm -hmm. for this. And I think that parametric design is perfect for designing these types of things. Well, you mentioned that this is definitely applicable to UP, but how about uh, the other universities where we don't have that, that they don't have that much luxury of space? Is there a workaround for this? Yeah, so exactly like in Taft Avenue, like De La Salle, although they have some mm -hmm. space, they have rooftops. Oh, they, they use their rooftops. And, and you can use these rooftops. Mm. And in, in other schools in Taft, they have actually nearby spaces. You know, they can use the, the parks there. The question would be now is that since these universities do not have jurisdiction over these parks, they can just have a MOA and say, we will bring our mobile, you know, our portable, mm -hmm. parametrically designed furniture with us. And they will take it away when we're done so that there's no need for, for a complicated system of, of you know, negotiation on changing the built environment for that, mm -hmm. that, let's say that park that the school will be using you know, that's under the jurisdiction of say LGU. Understood. Thank you, sir. So we do we still have uh, follow-up questions for, from the audience? So, I think that's a comment, more of a comment. Uh, more of a comment. So we have here from Zhao. This is very good, Sir Lucianis. I believe we as architects always find the greens and outdoors are somewhat recharging. Of course, it's true. Yeah. Very, very nice. Yeah, I, I here would... in Manila, we don't have much of the greens in the province. Sa amin, we, we have fresh air, much yeah, so available spaces. That's 100% true. I mean, I think these outdoor learning spaces can be very much used outside of Metro Manila, especially for universities that are outside because land in Metro Manila is very scarce. Um, I totally agree as well because uh, like what the literature says, learning outdoors really has a, a public health and mental well-being uh, positive effect. And especially now since it's COVID, we rushed, no? of course, because of the guidelines required, we, we used online uh, learning. But I guess now that hopefully we see a... a, a relaxation of these of these um you know these guidelines and a intention to go back to hybrid learning 
uh, this can be a a part of that solution. Well, my impression about hybrid learning, it's it's sounding a little bit like a gimmick still. What do you think about that? It, it's it's just gimmicky for me right now. <laughs> oh well, <laughs> it's definitely not. Um, <clears throat> it is. I would just say that I guess we feel that way in our part of the world because we haven't really, we don't have the infrastructure, the systems in place for it. But in places like Europe, I'm sure Architect Sierra knows this as well. And in, in Northern America, uh, this is something that they've been implementing as well. Uh, we in our country, we already have open learning, such as the University of the Philippines Open University, but it's 100% online. They, they were much more prepared for this pandemic, mm -hmm. considering that they've already gone through the experience of online uh, teaching and learning. Uh, the challenge now is really getting into that hybrid mode. Uh, it, there are advantages to this. True. We have a question from Shed. All right. Can we post it in our screen? How does this outdoor learning spaces address our climate setup in, here in the Philippines, especially the warmest hours during the day, of the day? Yeah. Thank you for that question. So uh, one of the considerations that I presented, the very basic one slide, uh, was to consider the outdoors itself, nature itself. You have to consider what is the most appropriate time for your lesson. So you can't just force the, <laughs> the issue. Um, knowing that uh, the Philippines is already hot and we have a wonderful weather of super hot and super rainy, but we do have pockets of really good weather. And this is when we can make use of that. The benefit of outdoor learning space is that we're also forced to create great environments mm -hmm. around our schools, which means that in order for us to make this happen, we also have to have trees. Or well, maybe so it's about time we, we make some space for public green, open space and there are you know and the the whole entire idea of tropical architecture tropical landscapes is to take advantage of all of these principles uh, for design that will create microclimates conducive to outdoor learning spaces and again luckily most of these principles actually beautify the environment so that could be uh, water the water features that ev evaporative cooling action uh, trees, number one, making sure you understand where the wind is coming from. And so you it's not just like placing it there. You have to integrate it into the schedules of your of your classes, with your, your syllabus and others. So that's a really uh, good question regarding this. Oh, and lastly, the materials you use are important because if the sun is going to shine on it for a long period of time, and then here comes the shade, and then here comes the students, you might be sitting on a very hot furniture so uh consideration on, on the material is also very very important nagkataon lang ba yung pangalan niya shed saka yung question niya about shed then. i don't know i have a feeling that probably this is an institution oh ah, okay shed okay. <laughs> and not a person really, really really good question anyway so i think that wraps up our webinar it's very insightful thank you again for the two lectures who presented si Sir Serio and Sir Aaron. Very insightful presentations indeed. Now to cap this webinar, let us welcome the head of Urban Design Studio Laboratory, Professor Richelle Reya Barria for the closing remarks. Please take it away.
we're just waiting for our, for Professor Shell to fix her camera, I believe. Once again, thank you everyone for attending this class. I'm sure it helped us a lot. It, it helped me a lot, especially in exploring a different, a different software. Of course, Grasshopper and Rhino. Right now, I'm exploring a different software also. I'm trying procedural, uh, procedural software similar to Rhino, and it definitely opens different avenues of creativity. I'm now able to create. Um, I think fancier objects for a lack of better of a better term and more complicated objects and more efficiently of course and i think it this is an opportunity for us to learn other software as well maybe not only rhino and grasshopper of this software comes with a hefty hefty price tag of course i can still remember before uh back in the day i think 12 years ago from now it was 2008 when we, with my friends, we were dabbing with this software called SketchUp or SketchUp, diba? Right? We all know it's widely available. It's like the industry standard here in the Philippines when it, when it comes to 3D. But then, uh, you know, uh, we, we tried to practice it over and over again. Back in the day, we don't have the luxury of tutorials in the internet. So we tried to figure things out. And to be honest, Eventually, we, we've become very good at it to the point that, to the point that we can create professional-looking structures. But then again, we kind of hit the wall. We kind of hit the wall because, as we all know, SketchUp is not really known for its user friend. Uh, although it's known for its user friendliness, it's not so much known for creating advanced mesh structures. Right. So it's time for us to explore different avenues as well. Now, I think Professor, Professor Rachel Rea already fixed her camera. So again, Professor Rachel, we'd love to hear from you the ending remarks. OK. Um, thank you, um, Architect Jekyll. Advanced architectural computing and design have proven to be the tool that remarkably augments design capabilities Knowledge of programs such as Rhino and Grasshopper enable automation, iteration, and design speed. It takes quite an effort in learning the language and the processes of the programs, yet these initial efforts are worth the opportunities for more innovation and creativity in the architectural design and applications relating to the built environment. The application and development of these techniques do not end with the basic knowledge of scripting, data structure and management, and the writing of these algorithms. It boils down to the purpose, the creative frameworks within which these parameters are made to function. As architects, how do we solve the design problems scientifically and promote our collective goals for climate action and sustainable development? How do we design urban spaces that are cognizant of the needs of society and promote inclusion and resilience? How else are we challenged to be holistic designers, adapt with the technical, the hardwares and softwares of the design process, and it's true to our humanistic sensibilities. The lecture now on our outdoor learning spaces has been an eye-opener. How do we foresee outdoor learning spaces in our own college complex, which can serve as models for future outdoor learning spaces all over the campus of UP Diliman and probably in different schools and universities around the globe? The interest in the design of outdoor learning spaces has not come at a more opportune time, now that there is a need to blur the indoor with the outdoor because of the constraints posed by the pandemic and other complex factors. The learning does not end today, but is hoped to continue with our students' parametrically configured, exciting and dynamic designs in their design classes, urban design plates, building science projects, as well as their practice in the future. On behalf of the University of the Philippines College of Architecture, the Extension Office, the Architectural Communications, Building Science, Environmental Architecture, Environmental Landscapes, and Urban Design Studio Laboratories, 
I would like to thank everyone for attending our webinar series on parametric design and digital fabrication. Special thanks go to our sponsors, Paul Sim and UPCA Kaafi. Thank you to our speakers, Architect Sergio Alonso Del Campo, <clears throat> the CEO, the co-CEO and co-founder of Control Mad Advanced Design Center in Madrid for sharing his expertise on parametric design <clears throat> And Assistant Professor Aaron Lectronas for its useful insights and techniques in designing outdoor learning spaces. We will continue to see more of Architect Serio and, Ar and Assistant Professor Aaron as we proceed with the workshops in the coming weeks. Please stay tuned for more information about these workshops from our host, Architect Jekka Manalang and other publicity materials. It has been my pleasure to close this webinar session today. Again, Thank you and wishing you all a very inspiring and productive work week ahead. A pleasure also, Professor Richelle, for that uh, very, very uh, appropriate <laughs> appropriate uh, ending remarks. So as always, just amazing. Anyway, this is the last day of our public online seminar sessions for parametric design and digital fabrication for outdoor learning spaces. The next sessions are by invitation workshops, so kindly wait for our announcement regarding that and how to qualify and apply for, uh, for it if you wish to join the workshops. Now, for those who wish to get, our, again, a certificate of attendance, please don't forget to fill in our feedback form through the link provided in the comment section. So thank you, everyone. Have, have a great day. Concrete is the second most used material in the world after water. With the world's population estimated to grow to 9 billion by 2050 and 2 billion more people expected to live in cities, 60% of the built environment is not yet built. This represents the equivalent of building New York City every single month. In a circular economy, nothing gets lost. Everything gets reused and recycled in a cradle-to-cradle -cradle approach. By giving a second life to construction and demolition waste, we can preserve Earth's precious resources. I see a great potential in this area when you consider that 1.6 billion people lack access to adequate housing in the world today. The NEST is the larger scale demonstrator to accelerate innovation and research in construction. Together with our 120 partners from academia, business and the public, explore the future of buildings. Concrete is a great material. It's very flexible, it's very performing. It's my belief there is no way without concrete for our future. As the world's global leader in building solutions, we are shaping the future of construction right here and right now. The future is green, the future is circular, the future is digital. Sustainability is a game changer for all of us. That's why I'm putting it at the heart of our strategy. And we are experimenting the next generation of circular products right here, with 50% recycled content inside. This is a cargo ship. 
And this represents what we are doing in sustainability in La Fache Sim, because it's a journey and as you can see, we are moving. But more than a journey, this one is removing 100 trucks of the road every single day. And this is exactly what we want to do. We want to build a world that works for the people and the planet. In La Fage Team, we are firmly committed to be part of the solution to solve today's climate crisis. This is why we set the most ambitious 2030 target in our industry, validated by Science-Based Target Initiative. Carbon neutral building is within our reach. You can see it happen all around us here by pioneering new technologies from digitalization to 3D printing, we are shaping the next frontier of green building solutions. But we didn't just look at what's a long-term goal, we look at what are we going to do tomorrow morning. So, no time to wait, we must start running right now. By using advanced computational design and engineering, we can model the structure of buildings so that material is only used where it's really needed. It's about optimizing material performance through structural geometry. In the HILO unit, we really want to show the future of construction in concrete. More specifically, we want to show a new way of building sustainably and following the principles of circular economy. I'm excited to work in concrete because you can shape concrete where it wants to be. We developed a concrete with 100 aggregates and 50% of the cement made from recycled construction demolition waste without compromise on performance. And concrete is a prime material to offer sustainability targets because it can be reused over and over and over again. What you see behind me, right there, this is construction and demolition waste. This is basically an old building. We broke it down in those pieces. We're going to grind it, make it back into powder, straight back in our cement or in our concrete. This is how this year we recycled more than 48 million tons of waste, making us a leading waste treatment company. Our ambition is to reach 100 million tons of waste recycled by 2030. Sustainability is to do a better world for the planet, but also for the people. So let's talk about the people for a second. In Malawi, there is a shortage of 70,000 schools as of today. We are building our first school in 3D printing right there. This is how we can support livelihood with our products. The beauty of concrete is that it doesn't only bring high strength and durability to construction, it is also infinitely recyclable. That's why for me, it is the ideal material to build a net zero future. I'm a big believer in the circular economy. The future isn't written, it's built.